My name is Stephen Doherty. I was uh, born in March of 1951 in Newton, Massachusetts, and I moved to Kalamazoo in June of 1978 to go to work for the Kalamazoo Wings. So when I came to Kalamazoo, I was hired uh, by Bob Lemieux, who was the general manager of the team. I arrived in June of 1978 as the, the new director of public relations for the hockey team, and I was promptly cast into the role of color commentator on the radio uh, that very first uh, game in, in October uh, with Terry Ficarelli, the infamous Terry Ficarelli from the Kalamazoo Wings. And I held that role for a number of years. Um, I worked with the organization from 78 through 2001, and during that time uh, I did just about everything from public relations to marketing, uh, eventually leaving the organization in 01 as Vice President and General Manager of the hockey team. So, a little bit of everything in between. The only thing I didn't do is, uh, well, you know what, I even did coach. I was on the bench for two games, two different occasions, um, which was a lot of fun. Once in Salt Lake City, uh, our coach was called away in an emergency and I was placed behind the bench, to run, which I didn't do much of. Them. Come on guys, let's go. So, <laughs> I thought that was good, so I guess I did do a little of that. <laughs> well, I was brought to Kalamazoo by Bob Lemieux. Uh, I first met Bob in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. Bob was coaching the American Hockey League uh, Tidewater Tides, and uh, it was a Detroit Red Wing affiliation. And I was living in Charlottesville at the time, and I happened to be skating, and, and uh, Bob invited me to skate with his team, so I did. I went out and skated uh, a day with them during one of their practice sessions, and um, asked me what I was doing and what I wanted to do and blah, blah, blah. And the long and short of it, I went to training camp with the Flint Generals in the International Hockey League the following year. And after being uh, cut from that team, uh, I went back to visit and took a bus ride down with the club and we happened to be playing Kalamazoo where I ran into Bob Lemieux. And uh, Bob apparently had just uh, relieved the current Director of Public Relations of their responsibilities and asked if I'd be interested. And, coming on board with the hockey team, and, and I thought, geez, if I can't play the game professionally, how about if I go to work in the front office? <laughs> so that's what I did. I was brought in in 1978 by Bob and, and uh, worked with Bob for a couple of years until he was let go, and then I had a number of different general managers that, that I worked under over those years before I became one myself. Well, the entire concept of having a team in Kalamazoo was brought to the Parfits and Jim Gilmore uh, by Henry Grooms. Henry Grooms ran the Kalamazoo Boxing Academy, which was located downtown here on the mall, just steps away from where the museum, in fact, it may even be where the museum is at right now. Um, and Henry Grooms was looking for a facility where he could hold his boxing matches. And he went to Ted Parfit, Jim Gilmore, had a conversation about bringing uh, a professional hockey team here to Kalamazoo, affiliating with the Detroit Red Wings, to fill the dates when Henry wasn't putting on his boxing performances. And uh, that's how it all got started. And it, it happened very quickly. Ted Parfit liked the idea. Uh, he invested the money in a franchise, the International Hockey League. Uh, they affiliated with the Detroit Red Wings, received permission from uh, the Wings at the time to use the name Wings. And uh, we were underway and in a mere matter of 10 months, I think it was, this building, actually it was less than 10 months, I think they started construction in April of 1974, and they were still bolting down the seats in the stadium on opening night in mid-October. So this stadium was thrown together very, very fast. Uh, an architectural firm uh, run by a guy by the name of Jerry Stifler was the guy that put the building together, plans and the design, and worked very closely with Bob Lemieux in, in constructing the facility to Bob's liking. And, and Bob, being the, the hockey guy and competitor that, that Bob was, um, had uh, took the liberties, I guess, of, of uh, making the facility advantageous to the Kalamazoo Wings by positioning the benches in a certain way that gave Kalamazoo an advantage on line changes for two periods out of three, something that most people wouldn't think anything of, but Bob certainly did and took advantage of those things and, and constructed the building that way. He uh, he also had uh, the wings bench elevated so he could see a little better up and over the players. He kept the visitors bench very low so coaches like Ted Garvin, that was probably no more than five foot six or eight, couldn't see. 
and uh, made it difficult on the visiting team uh, in, in all aspects of the hockey game. So <laughs> there's a lot of history in the way that building was constructed. read somewhere that the Red Wings were like 40% owners of the original team. Is that, is that, is there any truth to that? Or? You know what, I, they were part owners in the franchise uh, in 1974. Uh, to what percentage, I don't know. It wasn't a lot, but I remember, um, and I don't even remember the year. It might have been 79, 80, somewhere right around there. Um, Mike Illich had just purchased the Detroit Red Wings, and Mike Illich, did, want to, did not want to be affiliated with the Kalamazoo Wings. They had a, an American Hockey League team in Kansas City, and they were looking at moving that team into Glens Falls, New York, and wanted to sever the affiliation. So he came to Kalamazoo, and I, I'll never forget uh, Mr. Illich pulling up in his big limousine and uh, getting out and coming in, and we all had a meeting, a sit-down meeting with the Parfits, and uh, Ted at that time uh, agreed with Illich and, and bought uh, his share out whatever that share was, and, and we went out on our own at that point in time. So that was when the Detroit affiliation ended. Uh, there was a period where we were with Detroit, uh, then we affiliated with uh, Detroit, Philadelphia, and Vancouver all at once, and then that's when Illich came in and, and that affiliation with Detroit ended. So the relationship with Vancouver goes quite a ways back. It goes way back. Yeah, it goes way, way back. Yeah, yeah they're familiar with Kalamazoo. Well, there are all kinds of memories. Uh, you know, your, your, your first game ever, your first road trip with the team uh, were very special moments. Um, you know, never having played professionally for any length of time. Um, it, it's, it's a different lifestyle, different culture, and you really had to get used to that. I know I was a college graduate, and when I went to training camp with the Flint Generals, you know, to me, it was more fun playing the game, and I was competing against guys, juniors and, and older, that never made it through high school. And this is what they had to do to make a living, and, and there was a seriousness, a dedication to this game that I probably didn't have. Uh, I did it more for fun. They did it to make a living and survive, and uh, it was, as I said, an adjustment to uh, the different culture. And I, I think my appreciation for the game completely changed at that point in time. I was constantly learning about the game and, uh, and learned an awful lot from my experience of, of my short tenure playing the game of hockey in the International Hockey League. Um, so uh, it, it was different and I had to approach the game a little bit differently even when I uh, was employed you know, as a front office administrator. Um, your outlook on the game is completely different, focus was different. Gosh, you know what, the, the millionth fan through the door that was a memory because we screwed up the date. Uh, we actually <laughs> had the wrong date <laughs> and not the one millionth fan. So that was a memory that we had to correct. Uh, and those that worked uh, with me on that project uh, and others never let me forget that we picked the wrong date and, and the fact that we didn't have the right number. But it, it was fun and we recovered and, and moved on from there. Um, probably our green ice game that we developed was a huge memory of mine since you know we were the ones that, that put that game on ice and people all around the country stole that uh, idea from us so that was pretty neat uh winning the first turn of cup winning the second turn of cup back to back should have won a third turn of cup back to back to back but we wound up losing uh, we blew through the quarterfinals and the semifinals, and we sat around and waited for the saginaw gears at the time to meet in the final round of the playoffs, and we get swept four straight games. And I think a lot of it had to do with the layoff, and I think a lot of it had to do with the players getting sick and tired of our coach at the time. And uh, I think they stopped playing, quite frankly. And we wound up losing, which was a heartbreak, because we could have won three in a row. But, uh, and it's a long time between championships. It is a long time. So those, those are you know, very, very fond memories. Um, the people that I met in the game, uh, players, coaches, general managers, people affiliated with the game in the National Hockey League and that were great players, Hall of Fame players that I had an opportunity and a privilege to meet over all those years that, uh, that I was with the Wings. Um, I guess another memory was the day that we changed the name from Kalamazoo to Michigan. Uh, 
sad day in my mind, but uh, one that the International Hockey League had, had grown to a point where we had Atlanta in the league and San Francisco and Orlando and Chicago and all big names, and they wanted Little Kalamazoo to change its name to Michigan because it would be a bigger draw, easier for those clubs to market Michigan K-Wings coming to town rather than the Kalamazoo Wings. People go, Kalamazoo, where is that? They had no idea. So, they, so that was a, a change that Ted Parford probably had to swallow hard on, but he made the change for the betterment of the league as he did with all of his decisions. He always thought of the league first rather than the game. And uh, yeah, that was a big moment. And then eventually we changed back to Kalamazoo when, when uh, the International Hockey League shut down and we joined the United Hockey League. We brought back the name Kalamazoo and that was in 2000. Just curious, did you play college hockey? I played college hockey, yeah. A small school in New Hampshire called Nathaniel Hawthorne College. Um, finished up playing there, and as I said, I had an opportunity then to come to, uh, to Flint. Uh, I had first gone to uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, to try out with the Minnesota Fighting Saints in the WHA, and uh, was there for a, a week and a half, two weeks, and they cut everybody on the team with the exception of one guy. And uh, we all went our separate ways, and I wound up going to Flint in the International League and, and played there. I lasted there for two weeks until Chicago, who they were affiliated with, started sending down all the players, and then it became a numbers game, and you, know, you didn't have the ability, and weren't a star or a superstar, you get bounced, well, that was me. <laughs> I wasn't any good, I guess. So uh, I had a short stint with them during training camp period, and, and yeah, that, so that was my professional experience. Once again, you know, I met a lot of celebrities and, and superstars, Hall of Fame people in the National Hockey League that would either come in to scout or, or that came in to work with our players during our affiliations with Minnesota and then Dallas. Um, you know, Hall of Fame guys like Bob Clark, you know, that I got to know Gump Worsley, Harry Howell. I mean, these are names that you probably don't remember, but for me as a child, they were my idols and my heroes. And so I got to meet lots of people like that. And when the NHL went on strike, Boy, we had every NHL scout and, and player came into town to watch our, our International Hockey League and the players there to see if at some point in time they couldn't make trades to, to better their teams. But uh, a lot of guys in the NHL, um, a lot of builders of, of the league, um, players or uh, coaches, general managers that were in the International Hockey League, former NHL guys, and, and we had them on our own team here. Um, former players in Kalamazoo that went on to play in the National Hockey League or were on their way back down or were guys going back and forth and back and forth during our time with Dallas. There are just so many. It's hard to, it's hard to remember and, and name a lot of them. But uh, you know, a name probably recent to, to a lot would have been you know, goaltender Marty Turco that played in Kalamazoo, University of Michigan before coming to Kalamazoo and then went on to star in Dallas for six, seven years and uh, was a great player with them before being traded to Boston where he finished his career and is now doing TV for, uh, for the NHL. So uh, guys like that, it was just, it was a privilege and an honor to meet and be around. And, and to this day, you know, I stay in communication with a lot of those guys. Ken Hitchcock is another one. You know, Ken coached here in Kalamazoo and got his opportunity to go to Dallas and coach and he won a Stanley Cup in Dallas. And, and then from there bounced to Philadelphia and Columbus and, and eventually St. Louis. And, and now he's back home in British Columbia, kind of watching from afar. Um, we were sitting in a, a weekly meeting, staff meeting, in Kalamazoo, and Bob Lemieux had said at the time, you know, we need to build the attendance. What can we do to build the attendance? And, of course, everyone put their thinking caps on, and it was one of those think tank, think tank sessions that we had. And uh, being Irish, being from the city of Boston, um, I, I, I just recalling some of the events that took place on, in March for St. Patrick's Day. And this meeting, by the way, took place in February. So I said to Bob, uh, why don't we dye the ice green? And he looked at me like I was nuts, as did everyone else in the, in the room. And I said, no, 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 I'm serious. I said that uh, you know, when I was living in, in Boston, we used to skate outdoors when I was a little kid, and we skated in what they call the MDC rinks, and they were just a, a cover over, the, over an open ice surface. And they had green plastic, and the, when the sun came through, it, it tinted the ice green. And I said, why don't we dye the ice cream for St. Patrick's Day? And we'll promote this. We'll do all types of special promotions. And, and uh, let's see what happens. So we went 
uh, back to the drawing board and tried to come up with uh, the idea how we would go about it. And, and we thought we had the idea. We didn't. We thought we did. Uh, and then we held the event on Mar March 17th and we sold the place out. I think we had 5,400 people there that night. It was huge. But the funny part of the whole evening was we, how are we going to dye the ice cream? We thought, well, let's do it with food coloring. So we loaded up the Zamboni with its water with a resurface and we filled up the tank with food coloring, which we bought by the gallon from Gordon Foods, I think. And uh, the ice kind of came out striped more than it did completely green. And what we didn't know was that there's a, uh, a chemical in food coloring that actually prevents frostings from freezing on a cake. Well, it did the same thing to the ice. It, it didn't allow it to freeze. And we had puddles here and there. And, uh, we had laid down shamrocks over all of the face-off dots, and we made those out of cardboard. And they started to develop air pockets underneath, and they popped up and cracked. And it was, it was actually a mess. It really was a mess. Players, when they were knocked down, got up, and they had green dye all over their <laughs> uniforms. And it, uh, there were events that took place during the game. Uh, Stu Irving, who happened to be a friend of mine who played on the U.S. Olympic team, back in 1980, I believe it was, in Sapporo, Japan, or maybe it was 76 in Sapporo, Japan. Uh, they won the silver medal, and Stewie was playing for the Muskegon Mohawks at the time. And Stu Irving had a breakaway in the, uh, what would have been the third period, I believe. And Stewie came in all alone and got over the blue line and hit one of those puddles, and Stewie kept going, and the puck wound up about 15, 20 feet behind him. It's hysterical. It just stopped. And, People were cheering, and you know, it just was one of those things, one of those nights. And then since that point, we found ways to perfect it, and we painted the ice rather than we using food coloring, and we laid down tissue paper for the logos rather than cardboard, and uh, we kept building on the evening, giving away trips to Ireland, and we did all kinds of stuff, Irish music, and it just became a huge event. Uh, the National Hockey League caught wind of it, and they sent their television crew in, and, and they were there on March 17th and did a special on, on Wing Stadium and, and uh, in our St. Patrick's Day promotion. Uh, it made the cover, sports front page cover of USA Today, which I have a copy hanging in my house. And uh, yeah, it just became a huge night. And, uh, you know, everyone started stealing the ideas to try and bolster their attendances all across the country. And, uh, all of the developmental leagues. The National Hockey League would not allow their teams to dye the ice green, uh, but the minor league teams could, and, and a lot of teams did it. They did it for a year, two years, and, and then most of them quit because they just didn't have the perfection of how to do it. And we had built on that, and no one called to ask us, so we didn't offer it up. And that's kind of how it uh, evolved from then to today. But yeah, we had green beer. I mean, we thought of everything promotionally for that game each and every year. We had green water in the men's urinals. We had uh, green beer. We did trips to Ireland. We had Irish dancers. We had Irish music in the halls. Uh, I, I don't think we left a stone unturned, so to speak. It was great. Had we been able to get the Blarney Stone here to Kalamazoo, we would have done that. But um, it was a fun night, fun evening. People became involved. They it became very festive. People were wearing the St. Patrick's Day outfits in green, and we went on to, to develop the idea of wearing uh, a third jersey, the colored green jersey that we started. Um, that was a huge success, and we held the first ever auction, jersey auction, after that first game, and made a ton of money, which we donated to a local charity, and that became uh, routine for all of these St. Patrick's Day games. You know, you wear a special game jersey, and then you raffle it off and take all those proceeds and provide those to nonprofits in town, which is a great uh, is a great way to give back to the community. Was that the first time that had been done? It was the first time. Yep, we had never done that before. And other other teams now do those jersey auctions. They do. Yeah. Teams all over the country do them now. It's a real revenue producing event, and they can either keep the money or they can give it away to a charity. But everybody seems to do it. It's a marketing event. Yeah, no, I know it well. It's just it all started. You know, we started doing the colored ice. You know, we. We did the first pink ice ever for Valentine's Day, and we had, we got a couple married on the ice. We were going to do an orange ice game for Halloween, and we never got around to doing that. And, and it was colored ice, colored ice, and things just started to build off of that. And, and yeah, now they have Grateful Dead ice nights and 
children's artwork nights, and it's great. I just it's wonderful to bring all of these people in. It was very difficult, though, to get the traditional hockey guy uh, and player to perform on that ice surface. They were very skeptical about would they be able to see the puck and how would it be with, with a different color ice surface. And you know what, it just, it, it, nobody was bothered by it and everybody loved it. It was just a great event, so. Well, the game's evolved. I mean, you look at the ice back in 1978, uh, 74, when the team started, there were no advertisements on the dashboards. There was no ads in the ice surface. And today, it, it's almost cluttered and littered with uh, advertising, much like European hockey, uh, to a point where, you know, you were worried about seeing the puck. Oh, my goodness, with all the ads out there now, you could lose it in the ads. But it doesn't seem to bother anyone, and everyone's used to it. So, yeah, it's just the way the game has evolved. Another way to make money. Well, you know what, it, it depends on what level of professional hockey you were at. Um, when we were playing in the old International Hockey League, we were actually the second tier. Um, the American Hockey League was one step ahead of us. So the NHL teams that you worked with took most of their players from the American Hockey League. Occasionally they would come down when they were shorthanded for whatever reason uh, if they took players out of the American League, then the American League needed players so they would take them from us. And quite frankly, uh, having an affiliate at that level, much like the East Coast Hockey League now, um, I don't see as a real benefit because you don't get that many players from them. And those that you do get are constantly recalled and they upset the chemistry of your team uh, and make it difficult to win and be consistent game in and game out. However, if you go to the next level, and the International Hockey League grew to that point where we were on even scale, even par with the American Hockey League, and maybe even a step above, um, and the National Hockey League, being affiliated with them is, is a benefit in many ways. I mean, you do have players going up and down to disrupt your lineup, but they invest a lot of money in the team, and, and that's huge. They pay for salaries of those players that are coming down. You know, we had players in Kalamazoo that were making two and three million dollars a year, and uh, when you had to bring the paychecks down to the guys and you're handing out $700 to one guy and 10000 to another guy, uh, it was an interesting dynamic. Um, but I think working with the NHL team at that level is, is a real plus and players develop, you have great coaching, um, and it was just a joy to be at that level. Uh, when you get down to second and third, it can be a detriment, in my opinion, in my opinion. Yeah, we started out uh, with the Detroit Red Wings because we were a Michigan team and we wanted to affiliate with Detroit. Uh, we did that for about four or five years, six years, whatever it might have been. Uh, then we started to bring in other teams. We had Vancouver and the Philadelphia Flyers that we worked with for a year, maybe two. And then we affiliated solely with uh, the Minnesota North Stars, who eventually became the Dallas Stars. And, uh, you know, you get to work with that team for years, and, and I, I think that... Uh, that's a benefit when you're working with the same club and not constantly changing. You know the personnel, they know you. Um, it's just a much better situation. And I think we had that with Dallas until the very end when, when uh, Dallas was thinking they wanted a team that was closer to Texas and they were looking at Oklahoma City at the time. And when, uh, when the ownership here in Kalamazoo got wind of that, that's when the relationship started to deteriorate and eventually the team went away and the International Hockey League eventually went away. So, um, yeah, I mean, there are advantages and disadvantages to everything. There's no question about that. But uh, there's some continuity when you work for a length of time as we did with, with uh, Minnesota and Dallas. Well, I've seen it go down. Um, I've seen it go down a lot. And, uh, and that's hurtful because we, um, in the first 15, 20 years of this franchise, uh, worked very hard to to get it to a point where we were quite proud and, and it was very respectable numbers around the league. Um, and I, you know, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that we left the International Hockey League and went to the United League and then to the East Coast Hockey League. It's just not the same level that people were used to here in terms of caliber of play. And uh, you saw stars here in Kalamazoo on a Wednesday night and on a Thursday night, they were playing on television with the Dallas Stars. So people get to watch their guys go up and down, and, and I think that there was a real affinity for, for that. Um, 
and I think it helped attendance. People wanted to come in and see the John Casey's of the world who were playing with the North Stars, and all of a sudden he was sent to Kalamazoo as a goaltender and played 10, 15 games, and people wanted to come and see those guys. So I, I think the level of play is certainly a major factor, and uh, the ability, the skill level was, was certainly uh, exceeds what we're seeing now, and not to, you know, nothing against East Coast Hockey League, but it's just, it's not the International Hockey League, for sure. And, uh, and that probably hurts a little bit. And I think that you're finding the uh, youth hockey in this community has become a lot more expensive, and there probably are not as many kids in the program as there used to be, so um, we used to draw the families of those uh, members of KOHA. And, and that was big for us. We had great rivalries, which seemed to disappear when the United Hockey League came in and even the East Coast Hockey League. You've got a couple of them here now, but you know, back in the old days, the International League, you know, we had Grand Rapids, you had Milwaukee, you had Peoria, you had Fort Wayne, you had uh, Flint, you had Port Huron, you had Toledo. Um, Dayton was a, the longest trip. It's six hours, seven hours. Otherwise, they were all Great Lakes affiliated teams and they were close by and, and uh, Muskegon, I forgot about Muskegon. Um, people would come in from those cities to watch their team play on the road. And I think that helps an awful lot. And you see that here now in the East Coast League when, when Fort Wayne comes to town and maybe Toledo to a, to a degree. Uh, so that's a factor. Geography certainly is a factor. And uh, you know, the game has become more it's become more of a family event than it was before. Back in the old days of the IHL, you know, your Friday, Saturday nights, we were no less than 4,000 at a game and, and a lot of nights at 5,000. And it was Friday night, it was payday, and General Motors was located across the street, and those guys would get their paychecks and come across the street and drink beer and cheer and, and watch for the, the Friday night fights in the old IHL. That was entertaining for people back then. Uh, the game changed. A lot of the fighting was taken out of the game. A lot of the uh, aggressive play was taken out of the game. And it, it, people that were not hockey people wanted to turn it into a family uh, event. And to a certain degree, they did. And I think to a certain degree, it, it hurt a little bit. Um, you could also argue the fact that it helps in many ways, too. You get a lot of kids that come to see mascots and, and things of that sort. But it's a different product completely now. It's very difficult to compare the two. And I think there are a lot of factors that, that go into uh, changing the uh, attendance capacities at all of these arenas uh, in, in all of the uh, leagues around North America. So I have seen it dwindle. I've seen some great nights, though, the St. Patrick's Day crowd. and a few others where the numbers are up there. You just wish you could sustain that somehow. And um, I, I think the marketing approach to the game uh, is different today than it was before. Uh, a lot of people came, and I'll cite an example for you. A lot of people came to watch the game of hockey. Uh, they were true hockey aficionados, and they came to watch hockey. They liked the sport, and we had a lot of people here that followed the Kalamazoo Wings back then. I knew it was changing when the crowd started to dwindle for whatever reason, and we had to bring in things like the San Diego chicken to bring people back to watch not only the game and introduce it to a lot of people, but to watch the San Diego chicken, who was famous in baseball. Kalamazoo Wings, we were the first people to bring, the first hockey team to bring the San Diego chicken in in our league, and uh, he made the tour. He should have been paying us a commission for all of the money he made off the minor league hockey. But he came in, and you know what? We jumped from 3,500 on a Friday night to 5,400 people when the chicken came to town. So it was changing, and you had to do promotion. You had to do special things. You had to do green ice. You had to bring in Star Wars characters. You had to do things to entice other people other than the true hockey aficionado. And I think that's what the game is coming to now. They're, they, um, they need to be reintroduced to the game and teach your fans about the game, the rules of the game, so they understand the game and appreciate the game, and, and maybe you'll increase your attendance. Uh, you know, I don't see a lot of promotion regarding the league now. Um, it's all about mascots and about promotions that are going on as opposed to how great the East Coast Hockey League is, or how great the players on the opposing teams are, and that this is the stepping stone to the next level for these players. And 
come out and see your future NHL stars because a lot of players from the East Coast Hockey League eventually make it to the National Hockey League. Um, it's just a great, fast game. And um, I, I think that we've kind of lost, at the minor league level, we've kind of lost that true hockey aficionado other than that core of season ticket holders, which might only be seven, 800 people. Um, you get 5,400 seats over there, 5,113 at Wing Stadium to fill, and you need more than 700 people to do that. So it's, it's a big job, big job, and it takes money to promote properly. You know what, uh, um, we didn't have a lot of players of color, and uh, when we did, uh, on our team, they were treated no differently than anybody else. Uh, they earned a right to be here. Um, their skill level was such that they could be here and play and contribute. Uh, where you would see the difference, though, is when you went on the road. And occasionally, uh, there would be the cat calls from the audience. You'd hear things that uh, shouldn't be said to players. and. Uh, uh, it, it's, I guess, maybe unavoidable, but it, it happens. I think more so then in the, the early 70s and, and 80s than you see now. You look at the National Hockey League, there are many players of color coming into the National Hockey League right now. And, and I, not being there, I can't speak for those teams and those players, but I would guess that uh, it, it's, it's widely accepted now more so than it used to be and uh, we're making progress it's education and we're making progress and um, you know it happens not just to players of color you have european players we have american indians we have eskimos that have played in our league um, and the minorities unfortunately get picked on sometimes and uh, it's it's not fair but it happens and it's just uh, we need a culture change, and, it, and I think it's happening now. I do. I think it's happening at, at, uh, at the professional sports level. Well, I, you know, I think what I share, would like to share is the fact that uh, we are so fortunate in Kalamazoo to have a professional sports team, and uh, there's such a great history and tradition with our Kalamazoo Wings slash Michigan K Wings, now Kalamazoo Wings again. And um, I, I think that the original owners of this team would be very proud of the fact that it's continued on for as many years as that it has. Um, I hope that the people in this community don't take this team for granted and let it slip away, that they embrace professional sports, and in particular professional ice hockey, which is a great game. Attend the games, attend the events that are out at the stadium, and uh, you know, let's use this place uh, to our advantage and uh, make this a better community to live in. And I think the Kalamazoo Wings uh, do just that. They make it a far better place and a far better community to live in. And uh, it's not just because of the game, but the players become involved in community events and um, they give back to the community in many, many ways. So uh, I hope that we keep going and the attendance picks up and this Kalamazoo franchise is here long after I am.